Jamira Alexander, the President and Executive Director of Public Narrative. I don't have to tell you what this year has been. I think we've all had our own individual experiences in addition to our own collective experiences as a, as a unit, as an organization, as a community, as a people. I'm so thankful, so incredibly thankful for the people that are a part of our extended family at Public Narrative, from our partners, from event participants, um, our volunteers, our team, our contractors, everyone has done an amazing job in really helping us to sustain this beautiful organization. This organization that is centered on stories, community stories, and honoring though the stories and lived experiences of people. I am so incredibly proud of Chicago's young people and those who have participated in the Youth District Advisory Council Summer Leadership Institute led by the Chicago Police Department. When Public Narrative was invited into that work, it was eye-opening for us. We were challenged at every side. How in the world are you gonna work with the police department? But it was so imperative that we be a part of the solution at, at all costs, really. And in being able to establish a relationship and bring officers and young people into a shared space and have transparent dialogue about what's going on in, in our city, it has been just the most incredible experience. One that has allowed us to identify root issues, root causes, problem areas that are of things that are happening across Chicago, but in our society at large. Together with community officers, these young people work to identify issues that are taking place across the city and impacting Chicagoans in a very negative way but in identifying solutions toward, for some of those same issues, but particularly those who are doing something about it. They created a stakeholders map that would really give us insight to who's doing what on what side of town, the impact that they're having, you know, and the stories that are coming from the lived experiences of those being positively impacted by their work. When we started the Chicago Community Media Research Partnership, we had no idea what was ahead. We had no idea that we would live through a health pandemic. We had no idea that, you know, we were on to something groundbreaking in bringing journalists, researchers, community and patient stakeholders together. It was incredible to be invited by the Alliance for Research in Chicagoland Communities to partner with one another a partnership that has opened the door for so many other relationships and opportunities, but even more so an opportunity to really understand one another's world, the world of research and the world of media, and how in some regards, both industries suffer from a lack of trust, a lack of trust from community members, a lack of trust from patient stakeholders. And I can't say too much more about the impact of that project as we're still in the process of leveraging it. But you can check out the framework on our website at publicnarrative.org forward slash partnerships, and you'll find a complete summary of what that experience was. It's an honor to celebrate great journalism and particularly great journalism here in Chicago. And we've had the very fortunate opportunity of celebrating journalists like Karen Hawkins, Brandis Friedman, Maureen O'Donnell, and Michael Puente with the Studs Terkel Community Media Award. In addition, we celebrated Tanika Lewis Johnson with the Uplifting Voices Award and Jamie Calvin with the Ripple Effect Award. I couldn't be more honored to, one, live among these great journalists and community leaders, but even more so to celebrate their work in ways that help to change and shift the way that the public narrative is impacted. It's a very powerful thing when we invite a multiplicity of voices to the table. And we saw that with our podcast, Our Stories, Our World. We invited three young people to share their experiences and learn how to interview other guests who had their own perspectives. They weighed in on issues pertaining to public safety, health, and education. And one young lady even suggested that she wanted to start her own podcast after this experience. We had the opportunity to work with stakeholders from many different generations. 
So of course they came with different perspectives. They had different experiences and they even see the world a little different in as far as where we're going from here. But nonetheless, I think what it taught us most was how to treasure collective voices, how to honor those, how to celebrate those, but even more so how to invite those in way varying perspectives. I'm very thankful for the community stakeholders who have come together and really helped to shape what this organization looks like, but even more so help shape what the world around us look like. And I'm so incredibly, th I'm, I'm thankful for, for all these things because, no, 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 keep going. I'm thankful, for, I'm thankful for all these things because in a year where, you know, the first year of the, of the pandemic, it was a challenge, but there was a bit more optimism. There was a bit more, um, a bit more, not, not as much, but there was a bit more certainty of what was going on and how we as an organization needed to lead. Coming into the second year was a, a bit of a struggle in really identifying what do we do from here? How do we remain stable? How do we remain consistent? How do we continue to show up for our audiences, particularly as we're learning information just the same as they are? And it challenged us to put our vulnerability on the table. And as that vulnerability lay bare, it also challenged us to really think through how are we going to engage diverse audiences? particularly when our perspectives aren't the same and it could open the door to some sort of rift, some sort of disconnect, but yet we have to remain connected in order to see any sort of progress. So I'm, I'm incredibly thankful for the events of this year because those events led us to a place to really recognize this organization is not our own. This organization belongs to the people. And I'm so incredibly grateful for every person, young and old, who have brought their thoughts and ideas to the table to really think through how do we advance different issues? How do we advance issues that impact Chicago, issues that impact the, the nation, and issues that impact our world? And in thinking through a lot of these issues and a lot of these uh, circumstances, how are we going to navigate that even as challenges arise? I think as a leader, it made me a little tougher. I'm sure for my team, it probably did the same. Nonetheless, we are, are meeting things that were here long before us. And so I think the elephant in many rooms, um, some rooms that have been open to discuss and some maybe not so much, has been that of racism, systemic racism, oppression, microaggressions. We've seen and experienced in some instances you know, a variety of all these things constantly building and building and building until eventually something has to break. And we've all had some sort of breaking point during this time. I, I can't say that, um, I can't say that we haven't had the opportunity to be better because of those breaking points. But how have we seized those moments? And it's been our project partners that have helped us to seize those moments through events like our art and culture conversation between artists and journalists to understand how can we advance justice nar narratives and racial equity narratives through art and through journalism. And hearing from, you know, those dynamic speakers has really put us in a place where we understand a little better that it's gonna require more transparency and more vulnerability and less sugarcoating and less glossing over, but, but the willingness to be honest and true in our dialogue with one another and recognize the areas in the system that we wanna see changed and the areas that we wanna see shift. And being very realistic about the timing in which that may or may not happen. The, being honest about the circumstances that may prevent that from happening. It's been through these types of candid conversations as we saw with the Together We Heal initiative, conversations among the healers, conversations among the faith leaders, the neighbors, the storytellers, and ultimately our civic leaders. Is something how we get a chance to navigate the future together and how we respond to the criticisms and the experiences of the past. But it's all in how we weigh it and all in how we see it. 
It's all in how we invite allies and sponsors and mentors to help shape and help us, you know, shift the narrative. It's all in how we engage our community partners. It's all engage how, it's all in how we even access that word partnership. Do we access it with reciprocity in mind or do we access it with our own personal agendas? These are all things that have come up in our dialogues throughout the year. And as a, the leader of this organization, having a process, what does that mean for this project? What does that mean for the timing and delivery of this initiative? There's been a lot to weigh, particularly as the news cycle consent, continues to change. And there, there are being stories that are not being covered. There are being stories that are not being covered adequately in thinking through how do we help build capacity for health reporting, but you know other types of coverage that communities really wanna see and wanna engage with. We've learned a lot from a series of focus groups and a series of partnerships that opened the door for listening sessions that allowed us to hear from community members to understand, you know, how what's happening in the nation and what's happening in the city, how it impacts us as journalists, as youth, as members of the of the disabled community, as um, members of law enforcement, as re the research community. All of these things that are happening in the world are impacting us in one way or another. And what we find a lot of times in the, in the rhetoric and in the dialogue is a lot of disagreement, a lot of, um, in some instances, com competition, but not truly finding alignment. And it's, it's been our supporters that have helped us to sustain as we work to find alignment in, in and through all sorts of discussion threads and kind of like finding, you know, where is our common ground? How do we create an equitable society that establishes equity, you know, among races and ethnicities and equity in health and equity when it comes to justice and, do we even really want those things? Because it's one thing to say it, it's another to show up for it. So I'm incredibly thankful for all the folks who have shown up and allowed for your conversation and your actions to line up. It's a powerful thing when, you know, we set a goal, set a target, and we move out in action. And it's the actions of those who are in the trenches every single day that have been in lockstep with, you know, Chicagoans and other community members to help them overcome the challenge that has been this pandemic. As challenging as this year has been, I'm so thankful for those of you who have invested in this organization and our mission and our vision and our values and seeing through that we are able to help amplify voices that often go unheard that we're able to connect with community stakeholders in ways in which our world desperately needs right now, and for helping us to establish our place as Chicago's number one media literacy resource. As a communications organization, oftentimes we find that, you know, everybody thinks they communicate well, and quite honestly, none of us do. There's so much more for us to learn, but I'm thankful that we're able to learn together and your investment in this organization makes that possible. If you're interested in contributing to the mission of Public Narrative, please visit www.publicnarrative.org forward slash donate to continue this mission and continue our work into 2022.